Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday, the 3rd of October. As you can see, I'm back in the church and thank you for your love and concern over this past week, 10 days or so. It has been has been a bit of a challenging couple of weeks, but sometimes life is just like that. Thankfully, only my daughter took the COVID and she is making a full recovery from it. So thank you again. Today in the church service, we are actually having a baptism and it's the baptism of Sawyer Morrison. I'm looking forward to that. Unfortunately, it's the one part of our morning service that I cannot bring to you in this pre-record. But please know that everything else that we do and say is roughly what is said here as well. And we want you to feel part of the worship here at Moncrief. We hope in the future to be able to live stream and perhaps do a mix of pre-record and live stream so that there's opportunities there for you to be part of the, the gathered congregation here. But please know that whether you are a regular at Moncrief and you're not able to be with us this morning, or if you come from somewhere else, given that this goes out all over the world, please know that God loves you and we welcome you amongst us. It's a while since I participated in a baptism, um, given COVID, etc. So it is quite exciting. And we hope that you'll hold Sawyer, his two sisters and family in your prayers. So our call to worship today comes from Matthew's Gospel, and it's otherwise known as the Great Commission. This is from the Message Version. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorised and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up until the end of age. Amen. So we do, as Jesus commanded us, to go out and teach everybody what we know about him, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. May you know the presence of God with you as we gather in worship. And today we're thinking about God's generosity when it comes to mercy and grace. And we've gone through a few different themes or ideas of generosity over these past few weeks. And I do, I love this one. I love the idea that this holy God, who is beyond whatever we can imagine perfection and holiness to be, loves you and loves me. And so we're going to look at this story of the paralysed man, the one lowered through the roof by his friends. And it will challenge us to consider our stance on mercy and grace, God's mercy and grace for us, and our mercy and grace towards ourselves and others. Do we even realise how generous God actually is? In baptism, we acknowledge the fact that we cannot explain or understand God's grace. It is something that is given. It is a gift. And it's too phenomenal for us to grasp it, but it's given freely. And all we have to do is accept it. And so our first hymn today reminds us of the wonder of his grace and mercy. It's always been a firm favourite of mine and I hope that you enjoy it too. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Please sing along or enjoy it.
I hope you enjoyed singing along with that Charles Wesley hymn and giving it loudly in your praise to God. Following our prayer, Karen Moran is going to bring us our reading for today from Mark's Gospel. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, there is nothing we have done that means we deserve your grace and mercy, and yet we are recipients of it still. Lord God, how awesome you are, and your ways are beyond us to understand. No matter who we are, you welcome us with open arms, and this humbles us because we know that we do not deserve such love and grace. You who created the world around us, who has seen the passage of time through eras we are barely able to glimpse and loves each one of us as individuals, we praise you. We bow the knee and tip the hat with respect and fearful awe. Bless us as we come humble, yet reassured that with you all will be well. Forgive us when we are judgmental of others, when our words are less than gracious, our actions selfish rather than compassionate, our attitudes cynical or fearful. Give us the courage to approach your throne boldly with our needs and dreams. Stretch out your hand and free us from all that holds us back. May we be open to the unexpected, welcome the stranger and free the imprisoned in body, mind or soul. In your name. Lord, we come excited and nervous, yet confident that you will be true to your word, faithful to your practice, and see us as we are in Jesus Christ, your Son, redeemed, forgiven, restored. And so, with a spirit of worship and praise and gratitude, we join with his words, with your children around the world, and share together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Jesus heals a paralysed man. A few days later, Jesus went back to Capernaum and the news spread that he was at home. So many people came together that there was no room left, not even out in front of the door. Jesus was preaching the message to them when four men arrived carrying a paralysed man to Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they couldn't get the man to him. So they made a hole in the roof, right above the place where Jesus was. When they'd made an opening, they let the man down, lying on his mat. Seeing how much faith they had, Jesus said to the paralysed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law who were sitting there thought to themselves, how does he dare talk like this? This is blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. At once, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said to them, why do you think such things? Is it easier to say to this paralysed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up? Pick up your mat and walk. I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralysed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. While they all watched, the man got up, picked up his mat and he hurried home. They were all completely amazed and praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen.
They say that you should never meet your heroes. I don't know if you have ever met any of your heroes, but they say that it's something that you shouldn't do because you'll end up disappointed because we put them so high on pedestals that we're disappointed when we find out that really they are just like you and me. Not sure if you've been caught up in all the James Bond excitement and I haven't seen it yet and I will and so no spoilers. But I watched an interview in a TV series last night and, you know, it was really nice in a way because Daniel Craig was so relaxed in that interview and it wasn't like his James Bond character. And there's just something about being human that just shone out of him. But it's hard sometimes to appreciate that these people that we put high on pedestals really are just like you and me. I'm, a, I'm the worst at networking. I am really not good at this, working a room or, you know, getting to know the important people in a place. I'm not good at playing the system because I see everybody as human beings and therefore we should all treat one another alike. I'm not very good at top tables except at weddings. And this whole idea of sucking up to people just isn't me. When the MSP office phoned to say that she was coming to worship on a Sunday, I would often think, and? Not because I had anything against her or her role in society or anything that she did, but because all are welcome. And in church, if nowhere else in society, in church, we are all equal. None of us are more worthy than the person next to us in the sight of God and therefore in the sight of each other, whether we be prince or pauper. So folks, this story that we have today reminds us that God welcomes all of us. And I hope therefore that that's an encouragement to you. The paralyzed man on the mat is brought to Jesus, a man who at the time would have been excluded from much in life and not just by his disability, but by prejudice and the way that society would view him. Reliant perhaps on family support, probably a beggar on the street, and despite his friendship circle, had very little going for him in life. And it's interesting to me as a wee side note that it's his friends who bring him to Jesus and not his family, perhaps suggesting that even his family had disowned him. Of course, they encounter the crowds who are listening to Jesus and the crowds are not for moving either and they don't want any interruptions. There's no room for this man and his friends. They can just wait. They're not worthy of attention. For it may be fair to say that if he is a beggar, his four friends probably are too. It's kind of like the story of the blind man. You remember sitting next to the side of the road and hears Jesus going past an olive Ferrari and he's like, son of David, have mercy upon me. And the crowds tell him to shut up. And that gives you an idea of just perhaps the relationship here for the paralyzed man trying to be brought to Jesus. There are crowds in our churches across the world today who also close ranks and keep out lowlifes or those who don't fit in some way, those people that lower the tone of a gathering or whose lifestyles make our toes curl, who don't fit our models. And before we think that we would have made space to let that man in, be careful, because often when we think something isn't speaking to us, often it is. You see, the thing is, the people weren't necessarily aware of their actions. They weren't seeing themselves as selfish beings stopping this man from getting healed. We're not even entirely sure if he went for healing or just to hear him. But they did see him as an interruption, as an inconvenience, as a wait your turn. There's a pecking order. Indeed, it was kind of very British when you think about it. Just learn how to cue, mate. However, the four friends are definitely not British and they are not waiting. The four friends are determined that their friend should meet Jesus, more so than they should, but that he should. 
Cur curiously, we don't genuinely know if it was for healing or a pure determination to meet Jesus. Indeed, the man's reaction to being healed is to hurry away whilst the crowds are amazed at Jesus. His life, the paralyzed man's life, is changed in an instant. And healing would mean no more begging and finding a job. And I'd like to think that he was well up for that and was really just trying to avoid being at the centre of a potential brawl. After all, nobody likes that. Or maybe he just wanted to go find his family and so on. Again, for us, however, looking into this story from quite far away, there is value in it for the here and now. Most importantly in this story, I think, isn't actually the healing. Although, obviously, for the man concerned, that is pretty important. I think, most importantly for us, is that Jesus sees the human being. He sees the man before him on the mat and gives him dignity and identity. This man at the bottom of society, living on the scraps, is seen by God and welcomed as his child. Jesus doesn't see an interruption or an inconvenience. He's moved by the faith of these five individuals. And he has compassion upon the man on the mat in front of him. Like Jesus, we are not called to see the riches or the rags, but the human being within. Each person, each one of us is loved by God. And that's where the equality begins. And it's assured in the next statement. Your sins are forgiven. None of us are perfect. Indeed, before God, we are all sinners and the wages of sin is death, according to Paul. Yet forgiveness, mercy and grace are given freely by God. But let's be clear, though, because this kind of statement is often used in a judgmental or a, a way to beat you over the head with the Bible type idea. I genuinely don't think that Jesus is trying to say that this man deserved his condition, that his sin, his behaviour, caused his paralysis or caused his disability. I think it's a recognition of the man's understanding of himself. Often ill health or not being able to have children, etc., was seen as a lack of God's favour, that somehow, yes, we had done something that deserved it. And if it wasn't us, our parents had. And so somehow we had earned the wrath of God and this was our punishment in this time. And we often think in similar veins and we use phrases like we deserve that, that had to happen to us, or we speak of karma, both good and bad. Particularly when we have crashed out of life or hit rock bottom, we pile on the guilt. For me, I believe that Jesus, in his usual insightful way, spoke to the heart of the matter for this man. After all, he said in his comment to the teachers of the law, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat and walk. What the man heard and what the religious leaders heard are different. For the man, Jesus spoke to his heart and therefore to his soul. For the religious leaders, it's a different story, isn't it always? The religious leaders get more than peeved by Jesus' turn off phrase. My son, your son, your sins, sorry, are forgiven. It's personal but it's also provocative. When we see those who don't deserve forgiveness receiving it, we can often feel put out. And that's when we need to focus on the individual on the mat and remember that that or they are a person. And so the wider picture contained in this story is relevant to the institutional church. And at local level, we're aware, say, of the teaching in the letter of James, that we should show no favouritism in church. Everybody's to be treated the same. 
But we still even go further than that. Mark, in the telling of this story, sets up the conflict that exists between God and the established church of the time. The religious leaders walked a very fine line between protecting holy space, keeping the faith uh, keeping the people of faith on track whilst living amongst the Romans who were not the easiest of rulers. And you could argue that we live in a kind of similar uh, balance between secular society and the religious society. The words of Jesus put him on the level of God, therefore encroaching on that protection of holy space the authority to forgive sins belongs to no one except God. And there was a whole ritualistic system in place, never mind the day of atonement. And here is this man saying, your sins are forgiven. Blame me. Seriously, this would just really mess with their understanding. And indeed, it's a similar criticism, a, a similar Accusation that pushes the crucifixion of Jesus through blasphemy. In the church, we do the same. We protect so much, like God needs our protection. Even our communion tables and our fonts are fenced in by rules, which for some reason I can never remember, but shh, I didn't tell you that. We talk all about being equal, but human beings, we just find a way to put power plays in place Every church has a holy cupboard or a special china set. And for goodness sake, the heart of Presbyterianism is about governance and maintaining good order. And heaven forbid when that goes out the window. Honestly, we could actually be quite sympathetic with the teachers of the law. Because we're kind of just like them. If our systems, if our rituals, and that includes our rotas, if our interpretation of doctrine excludes or prejudices others, then we need to come back to this story again and again. We need to put the excluded on that mat and ask ourselves where we find ourselves. Where are we in that story? Who are we in that story? Are we blocking people meeting God with our insatiable need to be first, to be the most important? Remember, the church is here for you, but together we are here for our communities, for our parishes, for those who have yet to meet the God who loves them. We are not just about feeding people on a Sunday morning. Are we the four friends seeing the blocks and being radical and cutting a hole in the roof? Honestly, that would kind of bother me too as the homeowner but he doesn't get a mention, so it's quite intriguing nonetheless. So let's maybe not literally put holes in the roofs. But are we radical? Are we imaginative? Are we innovative? Are we creative? Are we able to work around some of the systems that are in place in our institutional church? Are we teachers of the law, the Pharisees, more interested in holding on to our established ways that we have spent generations looking after. Are you one of those, it's I've been done like that? Or do you see hope that we can focus on wholeness, acceptance, healing, rather than maintaining the crumbling and demanding established order? God came to give us freedom, and sometimes it's freedom from ourselves. But be honest with yourself too, for some of us are on the mat. Needing Jesus to look upon us with compassion, impressed with our faith, no matter how small, no matter whether we even know why we are there, and say, my child, your sins are forgiven. God is so generous with his grace and mercy. There is nobody that needs to be excluded from it. And it might take a lot longer for us as human beings to be able to show the same kind of mercy and grace to one another. But let's at least try. Because there is nothing we can do to earn God's grace. He gives it to us generously and freely, even though we don't deserve it. So if we don't deserve it, 
then we have to look to other people and think, you might not deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. How can we be generous with mercy and grace, recognising that we already get it from God himself? So let's be generous as we can and look upon one another and see the human being, not the label, but the person. We know that Jesus was accused of blasphemy and went to the cross. And yet, even there, mercy and grace poured from him as he said those words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His hands stretched out in love for you and for me. May you know that you are his child. Your sins are forgiven. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Amen. The hymn that the baptism family chose was All Things Bright and Beautiful. And so I put that there in the hope that it would be an opportunity for you to pray and praise and know that God loves you. We're going to have a time of prayer, which includes dedicating our offerings. And remember, our offerings are more than money. They're our time, our talents, our love, our compassion, our attitudes. And so we dedicate those and continue with a time of prayer for our world. Let us pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we matter to you and that everyone matters to you so much that you even gave your son to become one of us and die for us. You raised him back to life to sit at your right hand, crowned with glory and honour, so that all who trust themselves to Jesus can end up sharing in his glory in heaven forever as your family. We thank you that in Jesus we see how much we matter to you. When we think of these things, 
what can we do but be amazed? And gladly give you these offerings of our money and of ourselves, asking that you use them to help others know how much they matter to you. Holy One, we ask that you guide our feet that we may walk in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus. We ask that you guide and counsel those going through hard times and struggling to find solutions. Send them a comforter. Soften the hardening hearts of those in difficult relationships. Help them to make the decisions that are right for them. Hold those who are grieving or struggling with health issues, knowing that so many of our own are in need of your healing touch. Lord, we place into your keeping those who need to know that you are present with them now. We pray for those starting afresh or heading out on new adventures, those welcoming new life or new loves or new careers or starting studies. May they step out with confidence and with you by their side. Where people are suffering injustice, we cry out for wrongs to be righted and for there to be justice. We pray for the family and friends of Sarah Everard that they will find peace in the whole life prison term, forgiveness that they might heal, and grace that they might find hope and light in the days ahead. Bless all children and those who care for them, for those suffering abuse, a place of safety that they may know love, for children in war zones, peace, for those suffering hunger, food from your great world's bounty. And this Challenge Poverty Week, we pray that you would open people's eyes and hearts to see that people matter, no matter how poor they are. Help us to treat them with dignity and respect, valuing and appreciating them, and playing our part to help people out of poverty and to build a fair and just society. Loving God, may we remain soft-hearted, generous with mercy and grace, knowing that we have received more from you than we deserve. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, who calls us friends. Amen. Thank you for worshipping with us today, and it's been wonderful to share with you. Thank you to Karen for bringing us our reading, and to the Reverend Howard Hudson, whose work contributed to our prayers there. Thank you to um, all those who continue to support the work of Moncrief Church and we do continue to hold the institutional church in prayer as they go through challenging times. I pray that the Lord goes with those who make difficult decisions. Our closing song is one that you hopefully know and love as well, a song of celebration as we rejoice in the fact that we are in a relationship with God and that it is something to be happy about and to praise him for. So our closing song today, um, which I'm hoping will work fine online, because I couldn't find a kind of un, a, an informal version, shall we say. So this is by the Celebration Choir, and it's Oh Happy Day.
and our blessing. God loves you so very, very much. May God, who is the ground of hope, fill you with joy and peace as you lead the life of faith until by the power of the Holy Spirit, you overflow with hope and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen.